please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. And today's gospel, gospel talks about the tradition of the elders. I will be reading from Mark 7, uh, various verses. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain, they do they, in vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts and doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and you hold on to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within the human heart that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, and folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. After a long beloved pastor had retired from his post, it was the first Sunday that this pastor had to preach before his new congregation. And during the worship service, it came time for the pastoral prayer, not unlike in our worship service here. But when he said, let us bow our heads to pray, the congregation on his left and your right stood up. And the congregation on my right and your left stayed seated. He kind of noticed that as he started to pray. And as he was leading the congregation in the pastoral prayer, he started hearing some people over here talking to some of the people over there. And then people over here responding to what was said over there. And before you know it, he hadn't even got to the Lord's Prayer yet. And he had almost uh, a fight in the middle of his church. He quickly had an amen and moved on later into the service, but afterwards he says, I'm going to talk to the pastor who retired from this church. Surely this is not what they do every Sunday. And so he went to the, to the pastor who had uh, previously retired, and uh, he re evidently had been retiring for a reason. He was kind of getting on in age, and his memory was not as good as it used to be. And so when the pastor asked him, he says, this Sunday... He says, I, I really need to know uh, what's the tradition of this church? You know, how do they do things? Because this Sunday when I preached, uh, I mean, when I prayed, he said, uh, half the congregation stood up. Is, is that the tradition of this church that you stand for, for prayer? And he kind of, oh, I, then, no, I, no, I don't think that was the tradition of our church. Oh, then it must have been that they stayed seated because that's what the other half of the church did as they sat during the, the prayer and he went, hmm, hmm. No, I don't think that was the tradition of the church either. And he said, and he says, well, I don't know what to do because half the church stood and half the church sat and they all bickered and fought with one another. And he says, now I remember that was our tradition. <laughs> T 
Traditions do have a kind of a funny way of getting started in the life of any church or any religious practice. Uh, some of us remember when we came uh, to communion as children, probably in the Methodist tradition, that you uh, knelt at the chancel rail waiting uh, for a plate to be passed by. It had the little small uh, hard pieces of bread in it, and then you waited for the little round cup that was in a tray that, to receive communion, and then you would wait for a dismissal, and then all of you would get up, and then the next crew would come through. We, we all have kind of traditions that... Uh, that we can remember that we have in the life of our church. And we may put uh, holy import into those behaviors and those actions that may or not necessarily be needed. And that is a little bit of what is going on in Jesus' day underneath this auspices of washing uh, hands. Um, it was a practice, of course. You, you heard that being read in Scripture. The, it was a practice of the elders. This was a way to stay undefiled, to stay clean before the Lord. It was a practice of, of honoring God through your behavior and the way in which you treated life and the way in which you lived it. And one of those things was simply by washing of the hands and washing the cups and keeping everything clean. And most definitely, I'm not really for, as we know we're about to go to communion, you'll even see me put some sanitizer on my hand. We're really good about trying to stay clean, so it's, this is not a sermon about not being clean, but, but it is a little bit about what is the moral import into our actions because Jesus spoke clearly that what his disciples were doing by not honoring traditions, they were not dishonoring God. Jesus reminds us there's more to ethical behavior than just the act itself. It is a component of what we do. But there is also what is our intention. What do we intend? And quite frankly, in this particular case, the disciples did not intend to be an affront to God. And that their behavior of not washing their hands wasn't a moral objective of God. God did not write down into Scripture anyway that thou shalt wash your hands before you eat. You know, that's number 11, I guess, or 12 or 13, wherever it is. On No, it wasn't necessarily, or the cups or anything else, it wasn't. Uh, a moral issue by God's definition that was always evil or always wrong or and most definitely in the situation that they were living this out it wasn't an affront to God from Jesus's perspective therefore it wasn't an affront to God but it is kind of interesting sometimes isn't it how we can just maybe t looking at somebody or, or we can make a quick decision about somebody or something or we can even inhibit an, a behavior that we think is holy. But if we're ever asked why we're doing it, you might kind of scratch your head and you might say, well, I don't know why I've done that. I guess I've always seen my grandmother do it and and I saw my, my uh, people in the church do it, and so therefore I do it too. There was a, actually a church in uh, Eastern Europe, hundreds and hundreds of years old. I think it dated back to the 1100s. And uh, in, it was a tradition in that church that everybody, when they got to this one spot in the sanctuary, everybody would stop, bow cross themselves, and then go to the seat. Now, it didn't have anything to do with its relationship with the cross in the center because usually when you come into the, to a church in, in Europe or cathedral in Europe, uh, that uh, it's, it is a way of showing a respect to God and to the faith community that you're in to, to bow to the cross, to cross yourself, and then go sit in your pew. But this was like off to the side, one of the side aisles of the church. So when people walked down, they would stop. But no one knew why. And they were 
uh, undergoing a renovation uh, where they were rehabbing the church, but they were also restoring certain segments in the sanctuary. And so they were taking back some of the paint, the whitewash that was over the walls. And on this very spot, right to the right of it, on the wall was a mural underneath the paint of the Virgin Mary. Now, that painting had been covered for over 200 years. Yet for 200 years, the practice had still been, though no one knew why, <laughs> nobody was 200 years old to, to say, well, the reason why we kneel here is that there's a picture of the Virgin Mary. It's a reminder of the Mother of God, and we, we bow and cross ourselves, and then we go on. It's kind of interesting in the tradition of that church, but isn't it interesting how long that habit could continue with no one knowing why? And that is what Jesus is facing today in this particular instance of behaviors and practices of the elders that are trying to be perpetuated and pushed on uh, Jesus' disciples. And so there's just that question about why don't you do this? And what Jesus was really trying to say uh, to them is that what is the intent of the heart? Because out of the heart comes our desires. And that influences our behaviors and our actions. In the life of our church, we are going through many shifts and changes in our own culture. And therefore, some of our behaviors and our actions are also changing. Yet there can be times in which we wonder, hmm, I wonder if we're as holy as we used to be. And we associate actions over uh, our desires of the heart. And when I say actions, what I'm saying is, is that, do you remember that there was a time that you wouldn't enter this sanctuary if you were a man, if you didn't have a jacket on and a tie? Anybody remember that day? Any of that? Yeah. Do, do, do any of you feel kind of weird if you do show up in church without a coat and a, and a tie? Uh, I know there's a bunch of you here that, nope, that doesn't bother me at all. That's fine. Because that has absolutely nothing to do with your heart and your relationship with God. There's nothing written in Scripture that you and I have to show up in a suit and tie. Actually, what you start to notice now is, is that you'll have people in shorts and T-shirts and flip-flops, and that has nothing to do with our religiosity or our authenticity. I would dare say that anybody who takes time out on a Sunday morning to go to church rather than any of the myriad of other places to go to on a Sunday morning, that they're not coming here and saying, let me show you what, my, what their heart is. Let me show you how disrespectful I can be today. I'm going to try to pick something out that's just really going to perturb God and everybody around me, you know. I know Blaine thinks that when he's picking out his bow ties in the morning. I just, okay, which one is going to get the most comments today? No, no that's not our intent. That's, that's, that's not what our desire is of our hearts when we come into the Lord's house to, to worship. And therefore, I think we have made that slow adjustment even in our own lifetime, in our own worshiping understanding of how we follow God. Because even this day, when we come to communion, will we not? Will we wait for the ushers to send us to fill up the chancel rail? And quite frankly, the reason why the chancel rail is as long as it is in this church is that it was built and designed so that we could kneel as many people as we could on a Sunday morning so that communion wouldn't last so long for all of us to be here, right? But now that we have also moved on to intention as a form of communion, and we do realize that allows us to worship God, to receive God's grace, and the process for a congregation of our size allows it not to take an hour to receive communion, where maybe 
the intent of our heart is. I wish they would hurry up. I wish we could already get to lunch. I mean, can you imagine how our intentions might change just a little bit? <laughs> Even in a service where we know that it's holy and that it's beneficial and a means of grace for us in our life. But one thing that Jesus also shares for you and for me is that we can hide behind behaviors. We can look holier than what we actually are. We, we can have evil intent in our heart but outwardly, we got on the good clothes and the, and the way in which we're supposed to behave. And this is the way God wants us to, to live life. And I got all the externals. If anybody looked at me, I look okay. But quite frankly, inside, I'm dying. A young man went to a spiritual director to try to improve his walk. He thought he was doing pretty good. He, he thought that he was on the right path. And, and, and because of that, uh, he was explaining to his spiritual director his, his activities that he thought was helping him be holy, to become more and more like a saint of the church. He told him, he says, you know, I always uh, dress in white because white is a color of the robes in heaven that have been washed in the blood of the lamb. So I always try to wear white to, to show forth being that saint that I'm supposed to be. He says, also, the Bible says that you should never be a drunkard, and so I never drink anything but water. He says, I don't drink tea, I don't drink Coke, and I certainly don't drink alcohol. He says, all I drink is, is water, and I think that helps me become that saint that God is wanting me to be. He says, to remind me of the pain of the cross that Christ went through in my own life, I have inserted little sharp nails in my shoe that every time I walk, I hear, feel that prick of pain to remind me of what Christ did for me on my behalf on the cross. And while he was going through his explanation of all the little things that he does, the spiritual director kind of stood up and started to look out the, the window. And it just happened to be that, um, that on this particular moment, uh, one of the farmhands had brought one of the horses out of the barn to, to get a drink of water and was one of these solid white horses, just a beautiful horse, and brought him over to get something to drink. And he kind of looked at that horse and he said, come here. He says, see that horse out there? He says, yes, sir. He says, it's dressed all in white. And it drinks nothing but water. And it's got nails in its shoes too. Is it a saint? Or is it a horse? <laughs> we really do have to be careful about our behaviors because it's more than just mere actions. It's also what is the intent of our heart. Is it moral in the eyes of the God? And does it serve God and our fellow man in all that we do? God has a way for you and me to become holy that's so much more than just the mere washing of hands and cups and pots. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.